All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, who uh, should be noted is in a very different time zone and is, is graciously uh, extending his day into the wee hours of the morning to, to speak with us today. Um, and uh, is a very well-renowned and regarded international conductor and educator um, in Europe and the United States. He's conducted many symphonies, uh, known for his outreach and his work with youth orchestras. And uh, from here, I will give the floor to Mr. Maxim Eshkenazi. Ta-da, you said it so well. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so um, maybe I'll say a couple of words about to the kids, I'm not. I'm going to call you kids. I know you're not kids, but that's what I'm going to call you for now. Uh, to the students about my trajectory of my career, and then we'll open the floor for questions. If you have any questions that interest you, Sounds so good. basically, my trajectory is a little uh, different than most because I grew up in a communist country, um, meaning the education was very regulated in terms of who studies music and who studies physics and so forth. So I started going into music school when I was five. So um, my parents, my father is a musician. So my parents decided that I will be a professional musician. So I didn't have a lot of choice of my career. So I started at five, then I went to, um, what is that, primary, middle, and high school, all music related. Then I went to a conservatory. And then there was the moment, and at all this time, I was a violinist, you know, playing violin. And then uh, I end up at USC, uh, University of Southern California. Most of you are familiar with that school and studying violin. And then I transferred to conducting um, at one point, which was also a very interesting experience, but it was my choice, you know, going into conducting. If I had any choice in my career trajectory was the conducting part. So at the end of my, at, studying at USC, I started getting jobs as conductors around town at the Pasadena Youth Symphony House conductor. And after I graduated, I got the, um, I was assistant and uh, at Pacific Symphony, which is down south in Orange County. And now one of my main gigs in LA is I conduct three of the orchestras at Colburn School of Music, which is downtown LA. So in a nutshell, that's my uh, career trajectory. Uh, I've had the fun to play with some of the very fine musicians in the classical realm, not so much in jazz. In jazz, I played with a, a guy called Chris Bodie once. We did a tour with, I don't know if you're familiar, he's a trumpet player. Um, kind of soft jazz. And then with Joshua Bell, a violinist, we did a tour of seven cities in US. And from the other jazz players, if you're interesting, Herbie Hancock, we had a project, the pianist. Um, and that's it, that's my, my career. So let's open the floor and see if you have any questions. And then uh, we go from there. Sounds good. Um, so maybe on on a similar uh, vein, uh, and we can kind of we can kind of approach this in different sections or segments. Uh, maybe we'll take some questions just about uh, his career in general, and and how maybe how he found his way into conducting or anything related to um, uh, his work as a conductor. Do we have any questions in that in that realm? You can go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you do have a question. Jesse Lara, go ahead, Jesse. What exactly made you decide to switch to conducting rather than pursuing violin? Okay, well, 
first conducting, uh, first violin playing is very difficult, correct? <laughs> so I wanted something a little easier. No, it, it's, um, I always wanted the big sound of orchestra in front of me. Um, uh, let's see. I, I remember when I was a younger kid, about 12, 13, I had a chance, the director of our orchestra didn't show up to the to the rehearsal so I was like picked up the baton and start conducting and I remembered the feeling I felt like this is the best thing that can happen to a human being so I I was like whoa um, so I remember that feeling and I always wanted to get back to that somehow but for a certain time I forgot about that dream. And then when I got to USC, um, there was a class that we all had to take, all majors in violin or piano had to take um, conducting. And so I went to that Hans Baer, old German guy, and I conducted for him and he then, uh, uh, encouraged me to pursue career and of course at home uh, the Carrie's moms also encouraged me so it was both at school I got encouraged me encouragement of course at home I got encouragement so and then of course I always wanted to do it so I decided to switch and I had the chance to switch correct Sometimes you work really hard on your career and you just put all your emotions and all your time in it and it, nothing works. And sometimes there's a little luck. So there is this element of you know, divine help or luck that helps you transition from one thing to another that leads you in a more successful path. Uh, I have a follow-up question on that, and, and this might be a, a, a kind of a deep or tough question, but can you explain um, maybe that, that kind of instinct of following your, your, your gut or, or seeing an opportunity and then and pursuing it? Like, what, how, do you, how do you explain that sense of, of, of kind of following that, that direction that you might be uh, intrinsically motivated to to follow but you don't quite know that that's the path yet well the, the, i think there's a twofold the question first is like deciding to be a musician in general oh my god it's so difficult what a difficult career path uh, and yet a lot of people choose to do it because it's unbelievable um, we talk about different careers, about people being happy, being stuck in offices or this and that. And I'm, I'm complaining about my 12 hour flight to, you know, some country to conduct an orchestra. It's so it goes this way. Uh, being a musician, it's very tough, but it's, it's very rewarding the ups and downs are huge, correct? Um, you have to be able to handle that part, the ups and downs. Second, you really have to be on top of your game all the time because there's, for my job at Pacific Symphony, Elizabeth, there was 400 candidates for my job, 400 people wanting the same exact job. So it first makes you very humble when you get it because it's like, you know, 400 people didn't get it. And most of the time when you apply for any type of audition, you're one of those 400 people that don't get the job. So, and that's with every job that you get. You're one of the few that is getting a job. So you better be good at it and better try to do your best. Having said that, have I done many poo-poos in my life <laughs> as in professionally? Of course I have, um, both 
in pro professionally, both personally with decisions, but um, if you really like what you're doing, you have the energy to keep doing it. Now, with the, the, the sense of when you're making that gut decision, what to do, um, I've learned, and it, that's very scary, to believe my instincts. You know, you think about, should I take that job? Should I not take that job? Should I do this? Should I do this? You think about it, you analyze it, and it comes to the point that you just have to make a decision and you have to trust your instincts. Now, if you, um, that it's very easy to say right now because uh, when I followed my instincts in conducting, I was correct. Uh, what I mean by this, I'm a, I'm a very, I'm a better conductor than I'm a violinist. I was a fine violinist, but I feel I can give more to society as a conductor. Um, same right now in this COVID nightmare that we're all living, you know, the, with the little squares uh, on the screen. Um, in this time, I've, uh, I've accepted right now gladly they allow me to compose the music for a tv series here in bulgaria so that's what i'm doing right now and i'm finding it very very difficult but very rewarding correct so imagine i'm a violinist trained violinist that conducts now it's composing so that just tells you that you have to be constantly flexible just to be able to survive as a musician you know, you can't just say, oh, I want to do one thing and you do one thing. You know, you do, you do many, many things. You wear many hats, of course. And I'm continuing teaching conducting, you know, uh, now through Zoom at Colburn. So as musicians, with, as artists, you, you wear many, many hats. And you have to be very comfortable. All right. So that's about the gut feeling thank you uh any other uh live questions so far i also have a, a handful of uh front-loaded questions from the students um but if there's any other live questions right at this moment um or responses or follow-up questions ronnie yes i was wondering what advice would you give to us if we wanted to follow a similar career path <sighs> Okay, so a uh, similar career path. First, just to say very quickly, there's no similar career path. Every career path is going to be different, correct? Um, you can take the career path of Gustavo Dudamel and think that your career path will be the same or, or anybody. So remembering this, you have to kind of talk to yourself very honestly and say, um, I really love doing music. If you find out that music is one of the things that you really love the most, and you think that you have a chance, go ahead, you know, start pursuing it. But be aware that will be a, a long path, difficult path, but a really fun one. So my advice is, if that's, your, that's what you love doing, think it about as a post stamp. Imagine that you're a little post stamp and you attach yourself to music and you just go with it. And it's gonna take you to a very different path. I don't know if that makes sense, but you just have to uh, be consistent. I really like that. Uh that that stamp description i'm, I'm gonna borrow that yeah. one. Hopefully, hopefully you don't mind <laughs> very well uh any other live questions right this moment all right let's go to the let's go to the um pre-ask questions uh we got some good questions on here um let's see some of these already been answered very well 
Is there a difference between conducting in Bulgaria and the United States? That's a great question. Uh, so the actual technique of conducting, there's no difference. You know, when you've seen all conductors, you know, they, they give patterns of the music and ask for louder and quieter or more or less. That part is not uh, different. It's exactly the same. The, the only difference with Europe and US in general is American orchestras tend to be more prepared. So people come with better prepared parts, but usually have less rehearsing time with the US orchestras. Uh, in Europe, sometimes they're not as prepared, but you have more rehearsing time. So the results at the end are pretty much the same. High-end European orchestra and high-end American orchestra will end up giving the same product at the end. Just maybe it will take a little longer in Europe, mm. which for my taste is very good because you spend a little more time with the people and you get to know them more uh, in a personal level. You get to get used to with the flute player, you get used to with the bass section. So yes, there is difference, but, the, but differences. And also, of course, the language. Sometimes you end up in a place that you don't speak the language. And that's a great for a conductor. So because you have to express yourself only with your hands and with your gestures and with your emotions, which is great. Um, Follow-up question. We, I, I'm just curious uh, on those those customs. I I, I wasn't aware that uh, that was the the case. Is that is that just because of uh, you know the American tendency to to rush and kind of get things done and 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 culturally it's just a little bit different in in the European countries. Is is that maybe where it stems from? Oh uh, yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes in Europe you will make, let's say six rehearsals and one concert and you knew us you have to do one rehearsal and four concerts or two rehearsals and four concerts and i think that stems from the the orchestras in U, us being a different uh, a financial system they're entirely privately funded compared to europe where most of the orchestras are either government city um or funded in a different fashion or attached to a radio station, which is government owned. So the different uh, financial models probably dictate for the US, US orchestras to be more, um, more efficient for sure. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about the state of orchestras, professional orchestras in America right this morning? I mean, I guess we could say maybe before COVID. I do want to discuss music making in the COVID era um, a little bit later. But um, pre-COVID, uh, the state of orchestras in America, um, you know, we've, we've obviously heard a little bit of a decline there. Um, can, you, can you speak on your experiences in, 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 uh, in dealing with American orchestras and and maybe how we could uh, support the revival of the American orchestra as, as a generation of, of young people uh, going forward into professional careers in music? Well, I mean, the one thing that will definitely help American orchestras to reach bigger audience is the uh, diver diversification that word that I can't even say. Um, it's very important for the orchestra to survive, to uh, allow, to attract and to help uh, communities that not usually have not be represented in the orchestras. You, you know, we go from minorities to female conductors to all of that needs to happen because that will allow bigger audience to hear classical music. That's one. The other thing is that the US orchestra are in a constant limbo of getting enough finances. Every orchestra in US, uh, it's a constant fight of survival. And 
maybe that's a good thing because it keeps them very lean and very mean. You know, they have to survive constantly on a declining budgets and more expenses. On the other hand is in a time of COVID, we see how orchestras like Metropolitan Opera firing everyone, the whole entire cast, which is unheard of. So let's focus a little before COVID. So in general, classical music, some people are saying that there is a decline in classical music. I don't think so because it seems to be, we have constantly 4% steady uh, participation. So 4% of the population of US is participating in the classical world. But US is growing up. When I was going to school, US was 240 million, 240, 280 million. Now it's 320, 330, 330 million people. So, and the percentage of people listening to classical music seems to be the same 4%. So it is growing and um, the audience are growing. So in my opinion, uh, classical music is quite an achievement and just music in general, orchestral music. It's one of the few ways that we can hear music without any type of electricity. You know, you go to a rock concert, if the, the electricity goes down, the concert is gone, there's nothing. And you go to a classical concert, the electricity can stop. And as long as the musicians can know their music, they can keep playing because their instruments, as you know, they're entirely capable of playing without any electricity or discovered. So in, and I see a trend, a lot of people are trying to get to a real sound again, especially in, in the trendy places like LA, Chicago, New York, people are yearning live music and everywhere else. Very well, thank you. Um, interesting to hear your perspective on that as someone who is uh, heavily involved with the, the classical music scene. Uh, it's good to hear that, um, that you do have uh, hope and, and positivity for our growing audience and, and continued support of that. What can, what can these guys do um, as young people to uh, help support the, the um, resurgence or the, the sustaining of classical music? In, in our culture? I think the most important thing is to spread the word. Tell the other kids that are maybe not hearing that type of music, don't have that chance because sometimes it's uh, just not in the family or it's not part of the culture. It's to hear live music, you know, any type of live music. Tell them, spread it like the gospel. It's, you know, you need to tell everybody that this music, live music, with instruments that are vibrating by themselves, not with the help of a ACDC current, are the best thing that can happen to humans. And when you experience that live, I'm getting goosebumps even right now. I know you can never tell that on Zoom, but live music, makes us better and why it makes us better because the next day we can wake up happier and we can go and do our jobs even if it's an amazon manufacturing plant makes us better people and happier people certainly music makes me happier and especially now i can feel it viscerally when there's not a lot of music going on how suppressed is my happiness and when there is live music a week ago I had three concerts in a row which I felt is a gift from God it just was unbelievable anyway so 
that was one of the questions. So spread the word. Live music is the best. Yes, it's much easier to listen it on your iPhone, on your headphones. But experiencing art with others, it's one of the most humane things that we can do. Mm. Well said. So then pivoting on that, since obviously at this moment in time, that is uh, becoming increasingly difficult to experience art with other human beings in real space and time. Um, can, can you talk about music making since COVID and maybe like your experiences with, with your concerts right this moment and then where the future of, of music is headed in the next uh, couple of years as far as live performance due to, due to COVID? Well, it goes this way. I had a concert scheduled on the 7th of March this year, which I did. Actually, I did had a concert with Pacific Symphony. I had a, a kid's show. We did Peter and the Wolf mm. um, with Maggie, with a, with a team of mimes. And then I had another concert with Colburn that Sunday. And I had scheduled many, many concerts after that, correct? And on the 13th, I remember, it was Friday the 13th. Just like today. That is exactly like today. Everything stopped. Uh, I got the calls scheduled. We started with the word rescheduling first. And then um, all the rest of the engagements all that 30 or whatnot concert got rescheduled, then we canceled them. And then the first two weeks, I was the happiest camper at home. You know, I got sleep to sleep <laughs> in. I didn't have to travel to Europe. I just was in Europe in January and in February. March, I was in Mexico, Mexico City. And then beginning of March I was back so the first two weeks were gorgeous correct it was fantastic you sleep there's no flights there's no pressure because live music it's a lot of pressure psychological and any type of pressure and then my uh, I busied myself with my drone projects. I love drones, all kinds of drones. I design drones. So I tried to divert or my attention to something else to stay, stay engaged. Because they always say in Survivor, Survivor's move, those episodes in Discovery that when the mind gives up, then your body gives up gives it gives in gives up so i try to keep my mind busy and trying to schedule some projects for later on when there was thought that that this will be only until june july and in the summer it will disappear but it it became increasingly more obvious that there will be no concerts in any time soon which at this moment I was like, oh my lordy, Peter, what are we going to do with this? Then Europe start reopening a little by little. In May, a lot of European cities start reopening in a, in a very uh, controlled manner. And so the country that I'm born in and I'm from, Bulgaria, also reopened in June. And so suddenly those rescheduled concerts actually showed up and the, the managements and the orchestra started calling me and say hey you know the concert from april and may we're doing it now in uh, august and august september october and suddenly start concert starts coming in and so i was not believing those concerts will happen but they did happen and when they happened, I was on the, on the seven heaven. It was just spectacular. I remember the first beat that I gave after seven many months of not conducting. I lifted my hands, I gave the beat, and then the sound of a live orchestra just 
overtook my senses. I almost start crying. It was phenomenal. Um, then, then we got ready for a concert and I saw a live audience. Yes, it was half capacity. It was 50% capacity of the concert hall, but it's still the same feeling. I went on stage and there was applause and like every normal musician, egocentric, I was like, oh my God, they're clapping. So it was all, uh, it was mesmerizing and really, really made me affirm the feeling that I was born to do this exact thing to conduct orchestra or deal with music. It reminded me why I'm a musician in a very visceral manner. It was not something that I say lightly. This was special. And so there was a series of concerts and now they finished last week. My next concert is in December which I don't know if it's going to happen because the COVID cases everywhere are going higher. Um, so they have not closed the concert halls yet, but they might. So now I'm busying myself with, a, as I said, with a, a composing project. And this is totally brand new for me, but it's also very fun because most of you jazz people are lucky because you kind of made your music, you know, you, you, you create when you improvise. Uh, us, the classical musicians are, you know, very strictly playing what the, the dead people said that we should be playing, the composers. And then now I am the composer I have to say, open a comma here. Uh, I have a team of orchestrators and uh, computer guys that are helping me with the whole thing. I'm not alone. It's not like Beethoven writing all the, the notes himself. I come with the themes and there's orchestrators come in and help and orchestrate it. And then there's a, a, a whole bunch of people that add sound effects to the whole picture. But, uh, creation is also a lot of fun so I, I it seems to be the worst year for music in in the life of all musicians but it's turning out to be a very uh, good year for me in terms of discoveries mm. that's a good uh, point of discovery I think for for us you know we're we're still completely online for schooling and uh, we can't meet in in person uh, obviously to play so i think that's a good uh just reminder in general general to everyone that um just because it's different doesn't mean that you can't find other ways to express yourself or practice your art or things like that so uh stay curious and that that is a, a good example right there of just rolling with the punches and finding something else to do so uh thanks for that answer let's go back to the question board here Let's see what we got oh here's a fun one uh have you ever considered a career in anything else musically or non-musically i have i have and nobody should be afraid to admit this correct um i wanted to be a fighter pilot when i was younger i was I was training to go into the Bulgarian army and was jumping with parachutes and studying aerodynamics and uh, did some of my time with all that. But then I got into the conservatory and uh, I knew I'm, I'm gonna be better serving humanity being a musician than something else. Plus my eyesight was not as good as it should have been for a fighter pilot. Then I, um, I've always, always been flying something, you know, either paragliders, parachutes, airplanes, anything that flies interests me. So I, um, there was a moment in time when I dedicated a lot of my passion and time 
into drones, as I mentioned. I love the, that new era of flying machines. So I've been thinking about it, but every time when I start dealing with music, I'm like, wow, I love this way more. Um, so my curiosity, it's always been in the world of science, uh, especially in aerodynamics and all that. So um, I think most of the musicians always are curious about many things. Either it's gonna be something else outside of music, which is fine. If you can combine them both, you should, but if you can't, you should stick to one thing and really get really good at this. Mm. How about, uh, so you said you still have a passion in uh, drones and, and, and uh, aerospace and things like that. Do you think uh, as a musician, especially with a busy lifestyle and, and uh, you know, always being at music uh, events and, and things like that, um, do you think it's important to have other hobbies that you can you can turn to or other interests that you can uh, step away from the stage for a little bit and and uh, kind of do something else? Absolutely. I think it's a must because I see my friends, musicians that don't have any other in, in, uh, interests other than music. They, um, during that COVID thing, they took it much, much harder than I did uh, for the reason that I had other outlets for my curiosity. Um, also, in normal times, non-COVID times, um, it helps with the burnout. Now, no matter what you do in life, when you start doing it constantly for long periods of time, you reach a point that you burn. And the question is how to not only delay, but avoid it. And the answer is with other interests, either it's gonna be sports, science, other type of arts, something that it's out so you can take your brain out of it. Because sometimes I catch myself that I'm dreaming about music, then I wake up and I go to rehearsal, I do music in the afternoon, I can barely sleep because I'm still hearing music from the rehearsal. Then I had a concert where my adrenaline goes out of the charts. And then I, at night, you constantly hear music. So this, it cannot be healthy. So we have to have other outlets. If you don't have other outlets, I say, and you are on the path of being a professional musician, find other hobbies. I don't care what it is, even if it's a dog shows, I don't care. Have something to get your mind out of the music at least for a moment meaningfully for me it's flying airplanes because when i fly an airplane or a paraglider i cannot focus on anything else because it's survival you gotta fly well if you want to live correct so i really focus on it and it gets me helps me helps me get out of the music scene for a moment great Thank you for that. Uh, does anybody have any live questions uh, from anything we've talked about so far? Just wanted to check in. Anyone? Carrie, do you have a question for me that you've always wanted to ask me? <laughs> live audience. <laughs> well, <laughs> when are you coming back? <laughs> now, I don't know. When are you going to see my boys again? They miss Uncle Max. I miss them too. And we'll see. I mean, I, I, I'm... I want to finish that project here with the with the with the TV series that we're writing it. It's a a crime. It's like a, a, a contemporary Sherlock Holmes stuff, but not. It's set in Eastern Europe. So I'm I'm uh, when I'm done with this project, I might come to sunny California. As you can see here, it's cold. It's getting colder. Soon there will be snow. All the leaves are yellow and it's just gorgeous. And I don't drive car at all. I haven't, I was just sharing that I haven't driven car last week at all. 
and I drove a car just for the pleasure, not because I needed to go anywhere, which is that, that was probably a good thing. We'll yes. just get you off the road. Yeah, Max also has a love of speed. So <laughs> does your love of speed ever impact you when you're trying to conduct? You don't rush that tempo. <laughs> You know, you know, the tempo is a very good thing to talk about very briefly yeah. when you're jet lagged. You know, your sense of tempo with uh, jet lagging is really changing. I catch my performances of mine after heavy jet lag, like 10 hours, 11 hours, and they're much slower and relaxed. You know, you slow down your tempo depending on which part of the day your concert is. You know, the, 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 the curve of your sleeping schedule, not where you are, but where were you before you came there. Some days, you guys, all you that will become professionals will say, oh, I remember that crazy European, Eastern European guy talking about tempos and jet lag. Remember. It's a real thing. Yeah. It's a real thing. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I want to talk about one more uh, thing, Maxime, and then um, maybe we'll actually let me let me hit a few more questions, maybe. And then I want to just I wanted to ask you uh, to speak on auditions a little bit uh, for okay. these, these guys who have a lot of auditions coming up. And then we won't keep you too much longer. I know it is. Uh, what time is it over there in Bulgaria? It's close to 1 a.m. <laughs> Nice. He's burning the midnight oil here, folks, just for you. So <laughs> that's right. Thank it's Friday you so night. Much. I'm going to a party after that. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> this is I'm the joking right here. Yeah, that is the party. Zoom party. The that's way right. we like them. That's safe. Right. All right, Poor kids. I feel for you guys. I'm. I'm. I. I am. I apologize. In, uh, from the name of COVID that you had to live through this era, you, you guys. You have to study in the little screens and it's terrible. But like you said, you know, and I've been telling these, uh, these guys that too, is that when we do get back to it, I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be Rock different. Rock and roll. Yeah, everybody's gonna be making music like their life depended on it because it, they'll realize how it, important it is, you know? And you're gonna appreciate the time with your friends and you're gonna put the phones down because you're gonna be so burned of looking at screens by this time. Or maybe you will lose your entire sense of reality and will start living in the phones inside. The phones <laughs> and those computers. You know, I had a, a experience, I was in Paris recently before all that COVID. And I was texting on my phone and next to me, there was a friend and she was texting too. And a young girl, she was not more than 14, came to me and started speaking something very angrily in French. And I was like, okay, I did something wrong, you know? And another girl came and said, just to translate to you, to translate what the little girl said, she said, Spend time with your friend that is there. Stop looking at your phone. Wow. <laughs> and she was 14. I, I loved it. <laughs> it's definitely a good, a good reminder when you get called out by a, a teenager to, uh, <laughs> to live in the present moment. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we certainly will appreciate it when we get back to it. So uh, we will look forward to it. So one more question for you uh, here, Maxime, and then uh, I want to talk about auditions, and then I will I will let you find your pillow. Um, and now this is a, this is a tough question, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm just gonna streamline it a little bit. What is one of your favorite pieces? Uh, let's say let's what, what's one of your favorite pieces to conduct? Mahler one. Oh, easy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, I, I love conducting small stuff like Mozart, Vivaldi, Beethoven's, you know, the little tinier. But when you get to the full capacity of orchestra, when you go to the late romantic music of Mahler, Richard Strauss, 
um, those type of guys, it's really the sound is fantastic because you go on stage and you have 80, 90 people. And if you go into something like the planets by host, you have 120, 200 people with a choir. And suddenly the sound that just hits you, it's wow. So, but Mahler won particularly because, you know, Mahler said, there's nothing I can give more to opera and there's nothing I can give more into uh, the, the other repertoire. So I'm going to try in symphonies, but I'm going to make them the biggest and the best ever. And he did. And that first symphony is phenomenal. Great. I love, I love how, uh, how quick your answer was, you know, you ask people, what's your favorite piece? And they say, oh, well, that's a hard question. I got, you know, so you were just like, Mahler one. I like the, uh... <laughs> ah, but I have another hundred of them, but you know, it changes with age. You know, when I was younger, I would say Tchaikovsky fifth symphony. When I was even younger, I would say Vivaldi seasons. When I was even younger, I would say Michael Jackson thriller, you know, it's changes <laughs> over time. So, uh, right now at this moment, because I'm composing and I'm trying to steal from every great composer on the planet and don't be now, you know, the bad people steal the really great people borrow very well. Mm -hmm. So you have to, and, and it's very important to know from whom to borrow, go into the best ones when you're going to be borrowing and make sure it's legal. Okay. Right, gotta gotta throw in the legal disclaimer there. Yes, disclaimer. It's very important. Of course, yeah, we talk about that a lot in, uh, you know, in the jazz world. Is that you're you're always, uh, you know, just taking influences from other artists and then combining that with your own personal spin, and then what comes out is a combination of your uh, your influences and yourself. So in that in that case, you know, it's not it's not stealing. It's just uh, just recycling, if you will. And later on, you will find out that you start recycling your own ideas, mm. which really it's super cool when you start recycling your old ideas of themes and ideas and so forth. Yeah, great. Um, so, Maxine, we'll ask you one more question um, and then I, I'll we'll let you go. But I was wondering if you could just talk on auditions for a moment and uh, and especially as someone who has probably sat on numerous audition panels for orchestras um, could you give us some audition tips some uh, some approaches uh, any just any insight you have like if, either from the adjudication side or the performer side all right it, well just to say that yes I've said into numerous auditions probably several thousand of them hundreds and hundreds of hours of sitting through auditions have been part both sides in the panel and taking auditions. So it goes this way. Uh, the more auditions you take, the better you become. So start as early as possible. It doesn't matter if you're going to get the job or not, or the whatever you're competing. Find anything, audition, because you get better at this. That's the first thing. Second, is prepare meticulously prepare with metronome because that's the first thing that goes away when you sit when your heart when do you remember when i was talking about jet lag the opposite happens when you go on auditions because your heart rate goes out of the charts it's instead of toop, toop, it does and that happens with your tempo too you start rushing and when you start rushing, you start making mistakes. And that's the first thing they, uh, the adjudicators notice. Your tempo is too fast. Your musicality goes out of the window. Your intonation goes out of the window. And your technique, everything goes out. So practice. And I would suggest practice 10 clicks slower because that will be compensated at the audition. That's first, metronome, metronome, metronome. Second thing, second thing is intonation. You know, intonation 
also goes out of the window because of your higher blood pressure, you don't listen as much. So you have to be even better with this, listen a lot. And the third, it's a tip. So I would do this if I was you. If, if it's legal and possible, set up your alarm at 2 a.m. at night and do when you're ready with, you know, you've been practicing, you've done a couple of mock-up auditions to friends, play in front of friends, play for your friends, play for teachers, play for anything that moves because that will make you feel, simulate the same, um, simulate the audition, correct? Then make sure you set up your alarm and several nights in a row, wake up at 2 a.m. and do the audition as it is. If you can do it at 2 a.m., most likely you will be able to make it in the normal situation at the audition day. Of course, for all those that are doing reed instruments, make sure you have plenty of reeds. The people that are, um, whatever you need to feel comfortable, make sure you have it. And again, do as many as you can. Mm. That's good advice. I like the 2 a.m. Uh, the 2 a.m. trick. I mean, yeah, if you can, if you can hop out of bed right away and play your whole rep from a dead sleep you probably have a good shot at, at being because right yeah because your brain probably the capacity of your brain to perform at the audition is probably the same as at 2 a.m because of all the endorphins adrenaline that it's being pumped into your brain your capacity is probably at 2 a.m so if you can do it at 2 a.m you can do it at any time wonderful Thanks for that. Uh, anything else on auditions? I, we covered it. Practice a lot. Do a lot of them. Metronome, 2 a.m. Easy. You I, have like, it. I like it. Just write it down and you'll start getting the auditions. After the 10th audition, you start getting the stuff. All right. There you go. Step by step. How to win auditions. I like it. All right, uh, let's let's start wrapping up here. Does anybody have any last minute questions before we go? All right, listen, just I wanted to say one word to you guys. Yeah. Um, all this humanity has gone through much worse problems in the history. We all know it. You know, during the the the, the dark times in Europe, two thirds of the whole population of Europe was wiped out by disease. You know, we have world wars, we have, we've gone through a lot. What never stops fascinates me and makes me really happy is that humans always find a way. We constantly search. We are surviving now through screens, correct? That's a brand new concept, but we constantly look for the next way to get better survive and so we are going to do it and all of you I have so many colleagues that are giving up on music because they say well I can't handle this I cannot handle two years of not having work invent work for yourself invent things about you be proactive with invention I'd love if some of you invent a system that we can play together uh, orchestrally through Zoom or through some platform. You know, the only thing that we're missing is a time code that synchronizes everything and spits everything five seconds later, correct? That's all we need. And somebody of you are the people that will invent that. Some of you are the people that will play in Mars for first times. You are the future, so go make it brighter. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful closing remark. And uh, thanks again for your time today. Really appreciate you uh, staying up past the witching hour to uh, to give us some good wisdom and some good words. So uh, we'd, we'd love to have you on campus. Uh, in the future, whenever that may be, and uh, and your schedule 
brings you back to Los Angeles. So uh, I'd love to stay in touch and uh, and have you come work with our uh, maybe our orchestra uh, in a, in a live situation at some point. So love you guys. You're the best. I... You guys can uh, unmute if you want and say thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, you're so sweet. All right. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. thanks for being here. Bye, guys. I took a photo. Yay. Yeah. <laughs>